Thank you, Jackie, and uh, thank you, uh, Eileen, for the introduction. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here. You know, I'm, I live in Connecticut. I've lived there 33 years, so that makes me uh, a Yankee. Although the, I live in the part of Connecticut that the rest of New England doesn't think is in New England because it's way too close to New York City. Uh, but I love uh, coming to Texas. Been here a lot. I feel very uh, at home here. Have good friends in Dallas and uh, Bandera. I've been recently out to uh, uh, San Antonio. Had the privilege of. Uh, being in Austin, having um, uh, dinner in the in the governor's mansion, learned quite a bit about Sam Houston while I was there, and even have a cousin in the audience who was uh, uh, kind enough to join us today, who uh, who's lived in uh, Dallas and uh, Texas forever. So I again feel very uh, very much at home here, and thank you all for coming. Um, we have uh, this format is going to be very different from what I usually do, and I'm very happy about that because it gives me a chance to do something. Uh, as I say, a little different. Uh, normally, I'll, I'll go for an hour and I have a slide deck and uh, uh, then we have 10 or 15 minutes of questions at the end and, and that's fine. I do that all over the world. Uh, but in talking to uh, the NCPA, they said, well, why don't we just make it a little more uh, like a town hall, a little more relaxed. Uh, let's skip the slide deck. Let's just have a conversation. Uh, let's have more time for questions and less time uh, for me presenting, which I think is a great idea. Uh, I love the question part of it because, um, first of all, you can find out what, what people, you can get to what people really want to hear about. I can talk about a lot of things, but when people get to ask a question, it's what's most important to them, and so that makes it more valuable for them. It also makes it more valuable for me. Uh, you know, I talk a lot, but I try to listen and I learn a lot as well, and so I learn from you uh, through the questions. So I'm just going to talk for about uh, a little bit less than 30 minutes, and then we're going to have 45 minutes for questions, which is the reverse of the usual ratio. But I'm very, very happy about that, and hope we uh, hope we do get a lot of uh, questions. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm going to do, and this is I think particularly pertinent to the mission of the the NCPA. Um, uh, everybody wants to know what happened in 2008. What's happening now? What's going to happen next? How should I invest my money? Uh, what are the risks? Uh, what happened yesterday? Uh, First quarter GDP came out barely positive, may even get revised down negative. Who knows? That remains to be seen. But a lot of people want to know about the headlines and the markets and all that. And that's all important stuff. And we all have our savings, whether you're a 25 year old just putting a little bit away for a future retirement or whether you're a 75 year old who is retired and uh, you want to make sure it lasts. Uh, I, I like to say that when it comes to your own money, everybody has a PhD. Uh, you don't need to go to school. People tend to be very smart. Uh, about their own money, and those, so those are all good topics. But uh, but I think we'll get to those in the questions. Uh, what I want to do is talk a little more theoretically, because uh, again, I think it's in keeping with with the mission of, of an institute like this um, about method. Uh, when I say method, what is the toolkit? What are the techniques that I use uh, and others, some others, to to analyze markets, to analyze risk in markets, to make um, uh, forecasts uh, to construct a portfolio, etc. Because uh, I've had the privilege of meeting uh, and meeting or working with actually uh, many of the giants of modern financial theory. When I say giants, I mean these are people who uh, they have PhDs from Harvard or MIT or University of Chicago or Stanford or uh, University of Pennsylvania, Wharton, Yale, etc. As, as, the, as the case may be. I've shared office with, offices with Nobel Prize winners, uh, met with, you know, in, in, in uh, small groups, uh, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one with uh, members of the Federal Open Market Committee, Regional Reserve Bank presidents. So I know a lot of people at the Fed uh, and been on Wall Street many years. So I, I've partnered with, met with, um, associated with um, all the folks who, either from a policy point of view or a trading point of view, are running the capital markets that basically <laughs> almost destroyed the planet in 2008, and I think we'll, we'll do so again uh, sooner than later. And so people say, well, what's up with that? I mean, are these people dumb? Um, well, they're absolutely not dumb. I can, I can promise you that. If Janet Yellen and I sat down side by side and took an IQ test, she would blow me away. Uh, and so would Larry Summers. He's smarter than Janet Yellen. So, um, so that, no, they're not dumb. These, these people are absolutely brilliant. Um, and people go, well, are they, are they venal? You know, is this like some deep, dark conspiracy to destroy our economy by a bunch of, uh, of evildoers working in these elite institutions? And they go, no, 
Um, sorry, that's not it either. Um, uh, there may be some malefactors somewhere, but uh, again, having worked with a lot of these people, and I do, uh, one of my consulting clients uh, is the United States government. I work with the uh, Defense Department. I'll be going down to the Pentagon uh, next week for another war game and work with the intelligence community and others. Uh, if you knew, and some of you I'm sure do, if you knew how messed up the United States government is, uh, you, you'd put aside, lay aside any fears of some uh, deep, dark conspiracy because they can barely, you know, make it through the day, coordinate with each other, let alone uh, orchestrate. Uh, and then when people say the U.S. government, I just roll my eyes. I like to say, well, we have two governments. We have the, the Virginia government and the downtown government. You know, the downtown's the Treasury and the Fed and the White House. In Virginia, you got the Pentagon and, and the intelligence community and, and the defense community. So there, there's, there are two different, yeah, to cross the bridge to, 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 to talk to both sides there. So, no, it's not a, a, not a deep, dark conspiracy. I mean, look, there are things that go on behind the scenes. There are things that they can't talk about. Uh, I'll talk about them so we can maybe get into a little bit of that. But the real answer, the answer is, the answer to the question, why don't they see the risk coming? Why are they constantly surprised? Why is it happening again? How is this even possible? The answer to that is, they have the wrong models. They have the wrong intellectual frame for understanding risk. They don't understand the statistical properties of risk. And if you, get the, if you have the wrong model, you're gonna get the wrong result every time. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how much data you have. If you plug that into a model that does not correspond to reality, does not correspond to how things actually work, you're gonna get the wrong result, the wrong forecast, et cetera. And so let me, that's a statement, that's a claim. Let me try to back up that claim. Let me uh, take you through uh, some of the flaws in an existing model and then tell you the models that I use that I think are a lot more effective. I, I talked to, uh, I've kind of given up on the 55 year old scholars. If you've been doing one thing for 30 years, you're probably not gonna change it up, but I have more hope. I talked to the 25 year old scholars, I say, look, the, the people who win Nobel Prizes in economics 30 years from now are, going to people, are the people who begin today to do research and uh, empirics on these new models. So I'll talk about what, what those are, but it does take a, a long time to change minds. Um, the two biggest intellectual flaws uh, in, uh, in the Federal Reserve, in academia, and in, uh, on Wall Street today uh, the first is they believe in what are called equilibrium models. They actually call them stochastic general equilibrium models. And you know, an equilibrium model is sort of like, it's a clock, you know, and, and it runs down, you wind it up, you know, mechanical clock, let's say you wind it up and then it runs fine, it runs down again, you wind it up again. Uh, or it's, it's something kind of like um, uh, out of balance, it gets out of balance a little bit, you, you nudge it back and now it's in balance and, and probably stays there and if it gets out of balance again, you apply policy and you nudge it back again. So these are, these are examples of, of equilibrium models. But in fact, uh, the world is not an equilibrium system. The world is a complex dynamic system. And I'll come back to what, what that is exactly, but um, you know, a very simple example. Uh, so I have this uh, pen in my hand, and I say, uh, I'm gonna let go of the pen. Uh, but before I do, I'd like all of you to write down on a piece of paper, what's your forecast as the next thing that's gonna to happen to that pen after I let go of it. Well, you'll think about that for a second. You'll say, well, that pen's gonna hit the floor and Jim's gonna to have to go down and pick it up. Um, but, uh, and uh, so I let go, and what happens? Oh, it hits the floor and I gotta go down and pick it up. So your forecast was 100% correct. Well, why was that? Oh, how were you able to do that? Well, you have a model. You, you understand gravity. You understand that we're on the planet Earth. We're not uh, in outer space. You understand that the pen has some weight, and if an object has weight on the planet Earth and the force of gravity applies, it's gonna fall down. Uh, so you don't have to be smarter than Larry Summers. Some of you may be, I'm not, but you don't have to be smarter than Larry Summers to get a 100% accurate forecast. All you need to do is have the right model. Unfortunately, the Fed has a model that says if I let go, it's gonna float up to the ceiling. Uh, and that's, um, and that's really, uh, that, that really is the problem. Uh, so the first thing I mentioned are um, the equilibrium models. The second thing, and it's more fundamental, is the, the degree distribution of events in capital markets, or, which is the foundation of risk. When I say degree distribution, it's a simple graph like we all learned in high school. Uh, so the y-axis is the, um, uh, the frequency of the event. How, uh, uh, sorry, this, this, the y-axis is the severity of, of the event. How, how severe is the event? 
Um, I'm, I'm sorry, how did it, how, y-axis is the frequency, the x-axis is the severity. So we have um, calm events or kind of normal events happen all the time, we're used to that, and extreme events happen less frequently. Um, so that's kind of intuitive. So the, 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 the curve slopes downwards from upper left to lower right. So as the events become more extreme, they become less frequent. So that's obvious, we can observe that, and that's, that's kind of intuitive. But what is the shape of the curve? Um, and um, how frequent are the most extreme events? Well, um, all of the, the risk modeling and at the Fed and on Wall Street uses uh, a model called value at risk, which is all based on the, the bell curve. Now, the bell curve is the so-called normal distribution. The bell curve is an equilibrium system with a high degree of predictability. The power curve uh, is much more dynamic. And one way to understand it is um, um, just compare uh, a thermostat to a nuclear reactor, right? So your house is too cold, you dial up the thermostat, it warms up, uh, but it's a little too warm, now you dial it down and the house cools down. And that's a very, uh, that's an equilibrium system. You can dial it up, dial it down, it's linear, it's reversible, it's all under control. That's how the Fed thinks the economy works. The economy uh, gets a little hot, unemployment goes down, inflation picks up, industrial capacity um, uh, it, you know, diminishes, so the Fed raises rates, that cools things down a little bit, all of a sudden unemployment goes up, inflation cools off, there's excess capacity, they cut rates, that dials it up again. So you get this nice sine wave, you know, up and down, up and down, uh, very predictable, which is the normal business cycle that we've seen, uh, you know, 30 or more times since the end of World War II. Uh, but in fact, they're playing with a nuclear reactor. And a nuclear reactor has um, a complex dynamic system, a chain reaction of, um, of, uh, of nuclear radioactive fuel uh, with atoms splitting and, and discharging and splitting other atoms, releasing energy, et cetera. It's a complex dynamic system. You can dial a nuclear reactor up or down, but you better get it right because if you don't get it right, you're going to have a meltdown. That's catastrophic and it's not reversible. There's no such thing as a melt up. You melt it down, it's over. You've destroyed a city. And so my concern and my critique is that the Fed is sitting there with their hands on the control, dialing it up, dialing it down. They think they're playing with the thermostat. They're actually playing with a nuclear reactor. They don't realize it. And every now and then, the entire system melts down. And again, that is what we saw in 1998. It's what we saw in 1994, 1987, 2008. And we'll see it again uh, sooner than later. As I say, if you have the wrong model, you're going to get the wrong results. Now, what is the root of, uh, of complexity theory? Uh, or let, let, me, let me put the question differently. So I'm saying don't use these equilibrium models, don't use normally distributed uh, risks. They don't accord with reality. You will get the wrong results. So what, what is a better method? What scientific methods, what quantitative methods can we use that can give us better results? And this is where I part ways with uh, uh, Nassim Taleb. Uh, Nassim Taleb, you may know, is the author of The Black Swan. And uh, it's, it's, it's a 500-page book, um, uh, and it, basically it's 500 pages of taking a baseball bat and smashing the bell curve to the ground. I mean, he just really goes at it. Uh, and he does a good job. He's an entertaining author. I've met him. He's a, he's a very funny guy, very smart guy. And I agree with that. I'm, I'm like, nice job, Nassim. Somebody needed to just demolish this once and for all, and, and you did it. But he gets to the end and kind of throws up his hands and says, well, this doesn't work, nothing works, you can't model it, I'm a philosopher, I like Montesquieu, and see you later. So he, he kind of, he demolishes the bell curve and then checks out. Um, I wanted, in my research, in my analysis, in my writing, I wanted to take it further. I got to the same place he did. I said, okay, this absolutely does not work. But is there something that does work? With whatever limitations it may have, and you know, I think a good dose of humility is always uh, called for, uh, is there something that does work? And I went on a kind of a personal odyssey after 1998. I was, uh, I was at long-term capital management. That was the hedge fund that uh, imploded then. Um, we were uh, rescued with a $4 billion um, rescue package from Wall Street, uh, although I like to say they weren't bailing us out, they were bailing themselves out because we owed them a trillion dollars and if we had failed, we were hours away from failure. And if, if we had collapsed, we could have just slept in the next day, uh, but they were the guys who had to deal with the trillion dollars of exposure. So they were basically buying our balance sheet and then unwinding it, 
in an orderly way to avoid losses to themselves, which is fine. That's exactly what, what they should have done. Um, but uh, when I left there, I was there as a lawyer, but when I left there, I was very intellectually unsatisfied. I mean, my partners were the folks I mentioned. They were the Nobel Prize winners. They were the PhDs. They were the 170 IQs. They were the MIT professors. That's who was running the place. As I say, I was just a, uh, you know, a country lawyer out there in Connecticut. Um, uh, but I said, but wait a second, they're good guys, they're smart guys, but they got it wrong. You couldn't possibly understand risk and get this kind of result. It wasn't just a bad day. It, there's something fundamentally wrong in how you did this. So I set out on a kind of personal intellectual odyssey, studied applied mathematics, uh, physics, complexity theory, network theory, graph theory, behavioral economics, uh, a lot of other fields to develop my own models of, of how things worked. And I discovered that there are things that work. And, and just to start with uh, complexity theory, um, if you went to University of Texas or University of Michigan or any uh, Colorado, any fine school with, with a good physics department and took a course in complexity theory from somebody who didn't know anything about finance, they knew nothing about capital markets, they said, I'm just going to teach you complexity theory. What would they teach you? They would teach you that complex systems have four characteristics. Um, the first one is diversity. Uh, you need actors in a system who have different points of view. If you don't have different points, if we all think the same thing, if everyone in this room thinks the same thing, it's a really boring conversation. Not much is going to be going on. So you need diversity. Well, do capital markets have that? Of course they do. You've got bulls and bears, longs and short, greed and fear, leverage, non-leverage, uh, all different currencies. There's tons of diversity in capital markets. Okay. The second criteria is connectedness. What difference does it make if we all have different points of view, if we're not connected through some channel, if we're you know, Neanderthals, we're cavemen, and we're all in our different caves, and we think differently, but nobody gets out and connects with each other. Uh, that's not an interesting system. Well, are capital markets connected? Sure they are, probably over-connected. We got you know, Dow Jones, Reuters, um, uh, you know, CNBC, email, chat rooms, telephones, uh, um, uh, you know, all kinds of communications channels, automated exchanges, dark pools, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Tons and tons of connectedness. So, okay, you can check that box. Capital market systems have diverse players. They're highly connected. Uh, the third thing is um, interaction. Okay, you're connected. You get think, are you doing anything? Yeah, well, we've got trillions of dollars of transactions every day in stocks, bonds, derivatives, currencies, commodities, et cetera. So there's an enormous amount of interaction. And the, first, the, the last thing is adaptation. Adaptation just means my behavior affects your behavior and your behavior affects my behavior. You know, you know, I've been in the hedge fund business a long time. One thing I know is when you lose money, that's nature's way of telling you to get out of the trade. Like if you don't adapt your behavior, you'll get wiped out. So uh, that's an example, you know, a very, very simple example would be, uh, you know, you're, in, uh, you're in New York, it's cold in the winter, you wake up in your apartment, and you look outside, and everybody, you, you, know, you don't know what to wear that day, and everybody's walking down the street with down jackets and wool hats and big, thick mittens. Uh, well, you're probably not going to go outside in a sweater. Right? You're probably going to put a warm coat on and, some, and a hat and mittens. In other words, other people's behavior affects what you do, even though you didn't start out having a, a plan. And I can illustrate it with this room. Now, we have um, maybe um, you know, 100 people in the room or so. Uh, what if right now two of you got up and just ran out of the room, just bolted out of the room? What would the rest of you do? Probably think it was weird, you know, maybe a little rude, uh, maybe they got a text message or something, but you'd probably sit here and listen to the rest of this fascinating lecture. Um, but what if 70 of you got up and ran out of the room right now? What would the other 30 do? You'd be right behind them. You, you wouldn't know why. You'd say, oh, what, the bomb scare place is on fire, I don't know what, but I don't want to wait around to find out. I'm out of here, right? So in other words, your behavior is not predetermined. It's a function of what other people do, and that's sensible. Um, and so to express this quantitatively, um, that uh, your willingness to leave or not based on other um, numeric inputs is your critical threshold. Your critical threshold is the point at which other behavior affects your own behavior. Uh, and just to express it quantitatively, in the example I just gave, your critical threshold is greater than two, less than seven. Right? Two people leave, you sit, you sit tight. 70 people leave, you're out of here. Greater than two, less than 70. Guess what? Every one of you has a different critical threshold. Some of you are a little more bold. You're going you're gonna to hang in there. And guess what? Your critical threshold changes every day. 
Some days you feel a little, a little more bodacious, other days you're a little more cautious. Um, so now take the 100 people in the room and multiply it, and not multiply, but just extend it to 100 million people sitting at screens, trading and trading floors all over the room. You know, brokers, uh, you know, people on the floors of exchanges, uh, you know, et cetera. Uh, and you begin to get some sense of the complexity of the problem. So that's what we mean by adaptability. Now, so these are the four hallmarks of, of a complex system. Uh, diversity of players, um, connectedness, interaction, and adaptive behavior. If you have those four things, you have a complex system. Guess what? Capital markets are four for four. Capital markets are a complex system. Guess what the degree distribution of events in a complex system is? It's a power curve. We already knew that because we see the data. So if that's the kind of system we have, and there's good empirical data to support it, why on earth are regulators and Wall Street using normally distributed risk and equilibrium models to understand a complex system in which the events occur in accordance with the power law? They've, that they've, another example of this uh, is um, uh, cosmology. So from the first century AD until the 16th century AD, so a period of 1,500 years, the smartest people in the world, I'm not talking about superstition, I'm talking about the smartest people in the world, the mathematicians, and they, yeah, they, were, they weren't dopes in the 13th century. I mean, we had Dante and all that. I mean, there were smart people around. Um, believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. The sun, the moon, the stars all revolved around the Earth in circular orbits, and they were concentric. And this was obvious, because when you woke up in the morning, the sun was over there and it went across the sky, and at night it was over there, and then the next morning it came back up over there. So obviously the sun was revolving around the Earth. Um, and so uh, that was the model, and they began to calculate these orbits and make predictions. Well, a funny thing happened by the late Middle Ages. They began to notice that the planets weren't, weren't where they were supposed to be. The predictive value of the models was breaking down. It's like Jupiter's supposed to be over there, and it's actually over there a little bit. It's not quite where it's supposed to be. And it looks like it's going backwards. It's supposed to be going that way. Um, well, when you get data that contradicts your model, you're supposed to question the model. You're supposed to say, well, maybe I, maybe I don't have this right. But that's not what they did. What they did is they added to the model. They said, well, OK, so obviously there's this big circle, but there must be like a little circle on the big circle. They call those epicycles. And they say, when they go backwards, so there's like you're doing these backwards clockwise you know, loop-de-loops as you're doing a big counterclockwise circle. And they wrote those equations. And it got more and more complicated. And there were more and more loop-de-loops in Mars and Venus and all this. And, and finally, Copernicus, Copernicus came along and said, you know what? Maybe the Earth revolves around the sun. How about that? And these other planets revolve around the sun. And then Kepler came along and said, yeah, and maybe the orbits aren't circular. Maybe they're elliptical. And Tycho Brahe started doing a lot of uh, empirical observations. And lo and behold, the data lined up with the new theory. Well, by the end of the 16th century, the, the paradigm had completely changed. It was like the sun's the center of the, at least the solar system, if not the universe. The Earth and the planets revolve around the Sun, and they revolve in elliptical orbits, not circular orbits. So the whole thing had changed. But that took 100 years. It wasn't as if Copernicus came out with his first statement, everyone goes, hey, Nick, nice going, you got it. You know? No, it took 100 years to really make that intellectual change. We're at the same place today in capital markets risk management. The new models are there. The old models don't work, but the uh, people who embrace the old models uh, are wedded to them. They're married to them. They can't change it up. Like, it, it's hard math. There's, 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 the integral calculus is, is challenging. Uh, and if you've been doing it for 40 or 50 years, you don't want to throw it all away and say, well, let's do this thing over here. Um, the interesting thing is I've had the privilege of visiting with a lot of our top physics laboratories, the Los Alamos National Laboratory and um, uh, Applied Physics Laboratory in Baltimore. And when I talk to physicists about this, because they use complexity theory all the time. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what quantum theory and uh, nuclear uh, theory, and, and they use this all the time. Uh, and I say, you know, we should really do some team science. We should do some collaborative science. Let's get a physicist, an applied mathematician, a computer developer, an economist, a lawyer, a behaviorist. Let's get all these people together, make a team, and try to really wrestle this problem to the ground, try to crack the code. And the physicists I meet, they go, 
that's really cool. Let's do that. Let's put that together. I go over to the PhD economists and make the same proposal, and they go, what are you talking about? You have nothing to teach us. You, you have, you, there's nothing you got. Why, why would we talk to physicists? We have it all figured out. So it's interesting that the physicists are more open-minded about, about the economy than the economists are, but that tells you something about this paradigm shift uh, that I'm describing. So, um, so that's where we are. There are better models on the table. They do work, at least initially. The empirics seem to be very good. I use them. Um, been getting very good results so far. Uh, and uh, I'm not the only one. There, there are these little pockets of uh, excellence, the Santa Fe Institute, um, London School of Economics, uh, and, and the, the physics laboratories I mentioned. So they're out there. People are working on this. Uh, 50 years from now, uh, we'll all come back, and I think what I'm describing will be the norm. I think it will be how people understand risk in capital markets. But today, we're um, using a system that has the wrong models, the wrong paradigms. Uh, they will get the wrong results every time. Your savings and retirement are at risk because you're relying on a system that doesn't know what it's doing. Um, and uh, it's going to take a while to change. So um, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I got through a quarter of what I was going to say, but my, my, uh, my time is up. And I'm sure you're all tired of, of hearing me talk. So, so I'll leave it at that. It's just food for thought. Uh, this is in, um, in my books, uh, The Death of Money and Currency Wars, uh, Chapter 10. And, and uh, Currency Wars is about complexity theory. And I have a couple of chapters in The Death of Money as well. And it's also what I use in, in uh, my newsletter. We come out every month. And this is how we think about, uh, think about problems. So uh, I'll leave it at that. But I'm uh, really uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Sure. The, uh, the question is, uh, could I comment on the proposed IMF, uh, International Monetary Fund, acceptance of the Chinese currency, the yuan, in something called uh, the SDR, the Special Drawing Right. Now, I'll talk about that. Let me define all that for, for people who are not, um, maybe not familiar with that. So you, you all know what the IMF is, International Monetary Fund. Um, it's, got, it's got this like geeky exterior, but it's the central bank of the world. That's the, the best way to understand it. It's the Federal Reserve is our central bank. Uh, you know, when they set up the Federal Reserve, um, in 1913, it wasn't the first central bank in U.S. history. It was the third. The first two had been shot down, extremely unpopular. Um, and so the people who did it knew that Americans don't like central banks. So they said, let's not call it a central bank. Let's call it the Federal Reserve because no one will know what that is. So there, there is this history when, when technocrats and experts are trying to cram something down your throat, they give it a funny name so that most people don't understand what it is. So the Federal Reserve is one example. It is the central bank of the United States. The IMF is another example. The International Monetary Fund is the central bank of the world. Uh, well, what do central banks do? One of them is they print money. Everyone's like, well, the IMF can't print money. Yes, they can. They have their own money. Um, it's called a special drawing right. Now, why don't they call it world money? And that's a little scary, right? But um, it's a special drawing right. It is world money, SDR for sure. So when you hear SDR, that's what that is. Now, what's an SDR? Uh, first of all, they come out of thin air. People will say, well, the SDR is backed by a basket of four major currencies, you know, the dollar, the euro, the yen, and um, the pound sterling. And when you hear it's backed by something, that sounds good. You know, like a mortgage is backed by property. So SDR is backed by all these strong currencies. No, it's not. Uh, it, the, the value of an SDR is calculated by reference to those currencies. The only reason those currencies are included is if you, if you want to say, well, what's an SDR worth in dollars, you need a formula. And yes, those four currencies are in the formula. But that's all they do. They're there for purposes of, of calculating a cost rate. They're not backed by anything. They come out of thin air exactly like US dollars. So that's the first one. Here it's backed by something. Forget it. It's, it's just printed money, plain and simple. Um, now, by the way, SDR today is worth about a dollar forty, give or take. You know, it, it, it moves up and down based on those baskets. So, um, and everyone's like, well, these SDRs, you know, they're new. They'll never work. Guess what? They're not new. They were created in 1969. They've been around since 1969. They do work. Did any, does anyone know that the IMF issued printed SDRs in August 2009, over $100 billion worth? I think, that, I think I was the only person outside the IMF who noticed, but um, they did, and they handed them out. I consider that testing the plumbing. In other words, they wanted to make sure that worked, because the last time they did it was 1980. They went from 1980 
to 2009, a period of almost 30 years, without issuing any SDRs. So, you know, things get rusty and they went to make sure it worked. It worked fine and now they're ready for the next time. Um, and people say, well, is the SDR going to replace the dollar? Not exactly, and here's why. SDRs are not, you know, in Philadelphia we have an expression, walking, walking around money. That's the money in your pocket, you know, to, uh, for whatever. And uh, SDRs are not walking around money. They are only issued to countries. So we're not going to have SDRs in our wallets or in our credit cards. SDRs are used for the big things. So settlement of balance of payments between countries. Uh, I think in the future you will see SDR use, SDRs used for a longer list of big things like the price of oil. Uh, maybe the financial statements of the 100 largest corporations in the world, you know, IBM, General Electric, Siemens, Volkswagen, will be, will be issued in SDRs. Is the SDR in use today? Absolutely. And let me give you a simple example. There's an SDR trading desk inside the IMF. And so in 2009, they issued these SDRs. Well, who got them? Well, Hungary got some. You know, Hungary's a member of the IMF. They got a little slice. Did Hungary need SDRs? No. Hungary was up to their eyeballs in Swiss franc loans because all the people in Hungary said, well, I can borrow for 2% in Swiss francs and our, or 9% in florins, which is the local currency, so I'll take the 2% mortgage. They completely ignored the fact that the florin might devalue against the Swiss franc, and if you were getting paid in florins, you now couldn't afford your mortgage because the Swiss franc was twice as strong. So Hungary was desperately short of uh, Swiss francs. They got the SDRs, uh, but they call up uh, the desk at the IMF and they say, you know, I want to get rid of these SDRs. You know, what do you bid me for SDRs? And uh, uh, IMF says, hold the phone, let me call China. They call China, China says, I got a bid, doom, done. So now the SDRs go to China, China gives Hungary dollars, Hungary sells the dollar spa for Swiss francs and pays off the Swiss franc loans. So that's how it works. This is all behind the scenes. I'm not making this up. By the way, you can, you can prove this. Okay, look at China's re reserve statements from the People's Bank of China. They publish that online. Look at how many SDRs. Look at their reserve positions, mostly dollars, some gold, some SDRs, some euros. Look at the number of SDRs. Go back and look at all the SDRs that have been allocated to China by the IMF. The amount of SDRs that China has is greater than the amount that they were allocated by the IMF, which means they bought some. They had to get them from somewhere, and they bought them from people who wanted to dump them because they wanted other hard currencies. So this is all going on today. This is not you know, my projection. This is not a black helicopter conspiracy. This is, this is happening today. I, I like to say that the IMF is um, transparently non-transparent. And what I mean by that is they're transparent in the sense that they, they do put everything on their website. You can go to their website and find everything I'm talking about. But try reading it. Try, it's all jargon. It's all technical. I mean, uh, not that people aren't smart enough, but you know, you've got to be kind of an expert. To, uh, so I like to say the only people who really understand this uh, either work at the IMF or me and a couple other people. I mean, the, the number of people who really understand this but are not in the system, so to speak, very few. You know, Simon Johnson at MIT, um, myself, a few others, but, uh, but you won't really hear this uh, very frequently. So this is what's going on. So now to the gentleman's question, uh, there is a move afoot to take the Chinese currency, the yuan, and include it in this basket, bearing in mind it's a formula, not backing, uh, that I just described. This would be, this would amount to an anointing. This would anoint the yuan as a big time global reserve currency, along with dollars, sterling, euros, and yen. Um, and makes China a very important part of the club. Now, uh, what kind of what's the backstory here? What's going on behind the scenes? Well, what's going on behind the scenes? Because people are looking at other developments. China recently created something called the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, uh, and they got most of the countries to sign up, or most of the important countries, including a bunch of countries that the United States didn't want to sign up. We said, "Don't sign up," and they said, "Heck with you." We signed up anyway. Uh, the reason they're doing that, by the way, this bank's going to have $100 billion of capital and it will be able to issue bonds. And they haven't said what currency they're going to issue it in, but my estimate would be that they'll issue them in SDRs. Um, they'll be able to issue bonds and lever up the balance sheet. And they're going to do big stuff. They're going to build railroads, natural gas pipelines, oil pipelines, highways, airports. These are big, uh, multi-billion dollar, multi-year infrastructure projects. Well, guess what? If you're Germany, you want those contracts. Chinese can't build all this stuff. They can build some of it, but they're gonna, those, those contracts are going to go to German companies, uh, British companies, French companies. They're not going to go to American companies, by and large, because we're not in that 
club. So that's why everybody joined. Um, but that aside, so people look at this and they go, ah, oh, I got this figured out. China's buying gold. By the way, they are buying gold. That's not made up. China officially says they have 1,000 tons of gold. 10, uh, 1054 is the exact number. The actual number is three or 4,000, maybe more. I will say that every time I've formed an estimate of Chinese gold, when I got better data, I was always wrong on the low side. They always had more than I thought. Uh, but I, I would estimate they have at least 4,000 tons, maybe more. They're buying it in secret. Um, they're using military and intelligence assets. I talked to a guy in Hong Kong who's in the, uh, I think the guys who are in what they call secure logistics. Secure logistics and vaulting, these are the people who handle the physical metal. I'm not talking about you know, ETFs and gold futures and COMEX and all that. These are guys who actually handle the, the shiny stuff. A uh, guy told me that he brought gold into China overland at the head of a column of People's Liberation Army uh, armored vehicles. Uh, so they're bringing it in from Central Asia. That, that did not go through Hong Kong. That was off the books. Uh, but we do know a lot about uh, Chinese mining output, Chinese import-export figures, Hong Kong exports, uh, the Shanghai Gold Exchange. We do have enough information. Uh, it's not a complete black box to form an estimate. Um, why don't we have better information? Why doesn't China just tell us how much gold they have? Well, if you were out to buy 2,000 tons, would you want people to know what you're doing? Of course not. I mean, it might make the price go up. If you're a, if you're a buyer, you want the price to be as low as possible. So you're going to lie to people. You're going to keep it secret. You're going to use intelligence assets until you get what you want. Now, once they get all the gold they want, um, then all bets are off. And that's what I'm watching. Um, and then people say, uh, you know, just to take this a step further, the gold bugs. I mean, I, I, I have gold. I recommend gold to clients. 10%, by the way. Don't, uh, don't let anyone tell you I said sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. 10%, I think, is, is a good allocation. There are other things, plenty of other things to do with your portfolio. To me, 10% is the right amount. So if it goes down, look, if gold goes down 10% and you got 10% allocation, you took a 1% picky on your portfolio, not the end of the world. So. Um, so I like that, but if, if I'm right, this thing it goes up five, six, seven times, then that's your insurance on the rest of the portfolio. I also like gold because it's physical, you can't hack it. Uh, I think a lot of electronic, you know, um, people think they have money. No, what you have are digital statements. Uh, you have digital wealth. You know, this, the, the statement you get from your stockbroker, uh, the price from the stock exchange, your bank account, um, everything you have except land, gold, fine art, and a few other things, is digital. So digital can be hacked, your wealth can be wiped out. But I'm not saying get out of the stock market, I'm just saying understand the risks. Um, so um, so I, I do like a 10% allocation of gold for portfolio, but a lot of the gold bugs uh, go, well, here's what's gonna happen. China's gonna get all this gold, build their own infrastructure, the AIIB, uh, they're going to make the yuan a gold-backed currency, and they're going to announce this as a big surprise and run the dollar off the road, and the price of gold is going to go up to $10,000 an ounce. Gold is going to go to $10,000 an ounce, but not for, the reason, not for the reason I just described. Everything I just described is exactly what's not going to happen. What China is doing, China, China wants to be in the club. You're, we're in a club, right? You're probably all members of clubs. China wants to be in the big club, which is the IMF, the United States. They want to be in that club. But the U.S. Is, is holding a black ball. We're like, well, we might let you in our club. Maybe we won't. Uh, what, what kind of behavior can we expect from you? In other words, we're using that as a quid pro quo. So China is over here building their own club. You know, a lot of clubs in the United States were started because some wealthy uh, applicant couldn't get in the existing club. He said, heck with you, I'll build my own club, right? And that becomes uh, exclusive. Um, so China's doing both things at once. They want to get in the existing club. But just in case they can't, they're building their own club. So they're much more subtle, much more sophisticated. Now, what is the United States saying as the price of letting China in the club? And again, to the gentleman's question, putting the Chinese Yuan in the SDR and giving China more votes at the IMF, which is what they want, that's what's in play. The Congress is holding up the legislation to give China more votes. Uh, and the White House says, you know, those Tea Party guys in the House, you can't reason with them, they're standing in the way. Nonsense. You don't think if the White House wanted this, they could get it through? Barney Frank slipped a hundred billion dollar line of credit for the IMF in a defense appropriation bill in 2009. Believe me, if the White House wants it, they could get it done. But it's very convenient for the White House to blame the Tea Party, so then they go to the Chinese and go, ah, oh, those crazy Tea Party people, they're standing in the way. They're not. 
The White House is deliberately slow rolling this so they can get concessions out of China. What's the concession? They want to peg the yuan to the dollar. They want China to stop fighting the currency wars. They want China to stop promoting their economy and growing their exports by cheapening their currency. If you notice, the Chinese economy is, is collapsing. I mean, the growth is coming down really fast. It's not, it's not falling off the face of the earth, but they're, they're down from 10% to 8% to 7%. They're probably going to come in below 7%. Bad debts are piling up, the Shanghai stock. There's a lot of trouble on the waterfront in China. China would normally just cut their currency, promote their exports. They haven't done that. A lot of people are short the yuan. I think they're going to be disappointed. China's maintaining the peg to the dollar. That's the price of poker. That's what the US wants to see. So the US is saying to China, hey, if you guys are on your best behavior, we'll let you into the yuan. That will probably happen in, it'll probably be announced in October. Uh, at the October annual meeting of the IMF in, uh, it's in Lima, Peru this year. Uh, and then be effective January 1st. Um, so now China's in the club. Uh, at some point they'll slide this legislation through Congress. China will get more votes in the IMF. Uh, but what, what won't happen is China will reveal their gold and the price of gold will skyrocket on that news alone. Again, gold's going to go up, but for different reasons at a different time. Um, because the deal with the club is, you have to have the gold. You have to have the gold, but don't talk about it. The gold is plan B. Paper money is plan A. And the United States is saying to China, you want to be in the paper money club, that's fine, come on in, we'll give your paper money a seal of approval by including it in the SDR. The fact that you have seven, 8,000 tons of gold is great. That's also, that's your admission price for getting in the club. By the way, the U.S. and others have been working together to keep the price of gold down until China can get their gold. Once China gets their gold, they're in the club and then nobody talk about it. So this is, this is a lot deeper. And again, this is not conspiracy stuff. You can tease all this out of uh, available information, but you have to understand how it works, how, how this whole thing works. So, so let's look for that later this year. Uh, let's look for China to publicly announce how much gold they have, which will be another lie because they have three accounts. They have the People's Bank of China, the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, and uh, China Investment Corporation. So they have three buckets to put the gold in. They will move some gold from State Administration of Foreign Exchange to the People's Bank of China. They will announce that. It'll be a lot. It'll be some number, three, 4,000 tons. But they might have another two, 3,000 tons over at SAFE that they don't disclose. So it's the it's what they call the limited modified hangout. Uh, so they, they will upwardly revalue the reserves. The yuan will be in the SDR. They will get more votes. They will join this club. These other things will have a life on their own, but they'll be eventually co-opted. They'll issue bonds and SDRs. All of this is moving towards the diminution and the elimination of the dollar as an important global reserve currency. But this is not something that happens overnight. You don't go to bed one night and wake up the next day and the dollar is no longer important. It took 30 years for sterling to be diminished to a relatively unimportant currency. It was over in 1944 at Bretton Woods, but it started in 1914 at the beginning of World War I when they closed the London Stock Exchange. New York Stock Exchange was closed for five months in, uh, from August to December 1914. I don't know if uh, people recall that, uh, but they actually closed the stock exchange for five months. That could happen again. Um, so that process, beginning in 1914, ending in 1944, took 30 years. We're in the process. We're in the process of destroying the dollar, but it's something that happens slowly, but there's no reason for you to sit around and wait for it to happen. There are things you can do now. The, the question is, what is the um, kind of the process or timeline for the uh, diminution of the dollar as a global reserve currency and what will the impact of that be on markets and, and uh, particularly the price of oil. Um, I want to separate what the power elites want to happen from what I think is going to happen because those are two different things. What they want to happen is this orderly process that I just described. It would play out over years. Uh, it would go in stages. Um, it uh, would involve eventually substituting SDRs for dollars. Uh, and the impact of that would be inflationary. The, the problem in the world today is there's just too much debt and not enough growth. There is no way, mathematically, there is no combination of growth on current conditions and taxes 
that will pay off the debt or even make the debt sustain. You never have to pay off the debt, you just have to roll it over. There is no combination of growth and taxes that will make the debt sustainable. But if you can inflate the currency, then it is. In other words, the United States owes $17 trillion. How do you turn $17 trillion into $8 trillion? Cut the value of the dollar in half. So it's still nominally, it's still $17 trillion, but it it's only costs you $8 trillion. I'm sure you know the oldest joke in banking is, uh, if I owe you a million dollars, I have a problem, but if I owe you a billion dollars, you have a problem because you gotta collect. I can just walk away, I can say sleep in the next day. Um, well, we owe China four trillion dollars. That means they have a problem. Uh, because we could just say, hey China, here's your four trillion, you know, good luck buying a loaf of bread because we just printed it. And that's a, an extreme version of kind of where the elites need to get the world. And when I, when I say elites, again, it's not a conspiracy. These are people we know. These are finance ministers, professors, uh, Madame Christine Lagarde at the IMF, Jack Lew, Tim Geithner. They're, they're, they're people we know. Um, so this is where they're taking the world. So the, the orderly diminution of the dollar, substitution of SDRs, because let's just say that, and I think this will happen by the way, um, the IMF printed five trillion of SDRs. That's, that would be about uh, six and a half trillion dollars equivalent. They print five trillion of SDRs and hand them out to all the countries. And then countries all of a sudden had um, uh, you know, could buy imports because they could use the SDRs to, to, to buy them. Maybe they were running a trade, uh, maybe they were running a trade deficit, maybe their reserves were low. You know, foreign reserves are just your bank account, right? You make $100,000 and you spend uh, $80,000 and you put the $20,000 in the bank, that's your savings. Well, reserve positions of countries are just their savings accounts. You export a certain amount, you import a certain amount, at the end of the day, you have a surplus or a deficit, and if you have a surplus, those are your reserves. You go invest them someplace, the same way you do. And if you have a deficit, well, you better borrow the money, because uh, how else are you gonna pay it off? So, um, so let's say a country is running a trade deficit, and the reserves are low, but I give them a bunch of SDRs. Well, they can go buy stuff. They can buy Caterpillar tractors, they can buy oil, they can buy all kinds of stuff. So that's how you get the economy rocking and rolling again uh, through the use of credit, but printed money is the best kind of credit because it's perpetual non-interest bearing. So, um, so that's what they'll do, that'll be inflationary. But when the inflation hits, uh, you know, people in the United States will be upset, it'll show up in dollars, but the Federal Reserve will say, hey, don't blame us. You know, so those guys over in G Street go talk to the IMF. No one will understand where it's coming from. Uh, so, that's, so that's the plan. Uh, so that will proceed in stages, it will proceed over decades. You know, you don't have to have 20% inflation in one year. If you do uh, 3% a year for 22 years, you cut the value of the dollar in half. You do it another 22 years, you cut it in half again. So 44 years, which is really just the time from when your kids are born to when they become adults, the value of the dollar has been reduced by 75%. That's with 3% inflation. That's not 9, 10, et cetera. And that's the kind of inflation they think nobody notices. Uh, my analogy is, you know, a little kid grabs his mom's wallet and sees 50 bucks. The kid knows if he takes 50 bucks, he's gonna get in trouble, but he says, I'll take two and mom won't notice. Um, that's what 2% inflation is, just steal from you a little bit at a time and hope that you don't notice. So that's the plan. Um, but my, uh, and so it won't happen all at once. It will, the, the plan is to do it in an orderly way. The, the trend will be towards inflation but right now we're still wrestling with deflation. Again, this is where uh, I think a lot of um, analysts and observers and you know attentive people, unfortunately, and we're all we're all subject to this, myself included. We're victims of what I call the two-second attention span. Like you say something and it doesn't happen like the next morning, and like well you're an idiot because you said this and something different. Well. If you, if you try looking at over a year or five years or 10 years, because that's the right way to think about your retirement, that's the right way for younger people to think about their savings, uh, that's the right way for countries to think about debt management. If you, look under, if you look out over those time periods, these small changes add up to very big uh, results. And, but if you come back, say, well, what can I do today to prepare for that? There are, there are things you can do. Now, that's what the elites want to happen. Here's what I think is actually going to happen. I think we're going to get a catastrophic financial panic 
uh, sooner than later. I'm not saying tomorrow. It could be tomorrow, by the way. I don't rule that out, but I don't think it'll be tomorrow. I don't necessarily think it'll be 2016. Uh, but sometime in the next couple years, this is not a 10-year forecast. I only say that because looking at 87, 94, 98, 2000, 2008, I mean, these were all catastrophic near meltdowns, and they happen every five, six, seven years. It's been six years since the last one. So how close could we be to the next one? The answer is probably pretty close. When that happens, it's going to be a lot worse than 2008. And the reason I say that is because the system is bigger. And going back to complexity theory that I talked about, the worst thing that can happen in a complex system is an exponential function of scale. And again, what I mean by that, let's say Jamie Dimon was sitting here and I said, you know, you know Mr. Dimon, you tripled your derivatives book. You tripled your derivatives book, gross notional value. How much did the risk go up? He would say, well, it went up a little tiny bit. Because, yeah, we tripled it in gross value, but it's long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short. All we do is expand the balance sheet. But when you net it all down, you net the longs against the shorts. The net risk is very, very small. Uh, that's value at risk. If you ask my mother, my mother's 84 years old. She's very smart, but she's not an economist. I said, Mom, I tripled the size of the book. How much did the risk go up? She would probably say it tripled. Like, that's kind of intuitive, common sense, right? Jamie Dimon's wrong. My mother's wrong. Uh, the answer is, if you tripled the size of the book, the risk went up by a factor, 10 or 100 or maybe 1,000 times. That's what an exponential geometric function is. That's how complex systems actually work. Now, in 2008, what did you hear about? Too big to fail, too big to fail, too big to fail, right? We heard that all day long. Well, guess what? The biggest banks in 2008 today are bigger. They have a larger percentage of all the banking assets. The derivatives books are bigger. Everything that was too big to fail in 2008 is bigger today. And if you take what I just said about um, the function of risk, if it's that much bigger, the risk is exponentially greater than we had in 2008. So don't think for a minute that um, the regulators have figured it out. If we're going back to the beginning of my remarks, you get the wrong model, you get the wrong result every time. They haven't figured it out. The system is bigger, more dangerous, more leveraged. Um, it'll pop up someplace else. I'm not saying it'll be a a, a no dock, no down payment uh, mortgage out of Las Vegas. I'm not saying that's going to be ground zero. Could be oil patch, actually. Uh, could be uh, where all this, all this oil from fracking. It's great. Where did it come from? Well, $5 trillion of borrowed money, that's where it came from. Good technology, hard work, good entre entrepreneurship, $5 trillion of borrowed money. Emerging markets, $9 trillion. These are big numbers. So this is kind of what's, what's coming out. So when that happens, and it'll be unexpected, right, because a certain number of people are going to run out of the room and everyone else is going to be right behind them. And that's not in the regulator's model, but that's what will happen. Now, so go back to 1998. What happened in 1998? A hedge fund collapsed. It was on the verge of taking down markets, and Wall Street bailed out the hedge fund. In 2008, Wall Street collapsed. It was on the verge of taking down the markets, and the central banks bailed out Wall Street. In 2018, it's the central banks and the sovereigns themselves that are going to be on the verge of collapse. Who's going to bail them out? In other words, we've done these bailouts. We've papered it over, granted. But each time it was bigger than the time before, and each time it took a bigger balance sheet to bail out whatever was happening. So 98 Wall Street bails out a hedge fund. 2008 central banks bail out Wall Street. 2018, who's going to bail out the central banks? There's only one balance sheet, one clean balance sheet left in the world. That's the IMF. And they're going to come with these SDRs by the trillions. And that's why they did the fire drill in 2009 to make sure it works. And that's going to be very inflationary. And that's not, that's not the plan. The plan is a 10, 20 year plan. But they're going to have to accelerate that plan and do it in a matter of weeks or months while markets are crashing all over the world. And other bad things are going to be happening, by the way. Um, and uh, and, and then, then you'll have the SDR. China will be on the bus, not off the bus. But the result will be very inflationary. Well, uh, the, the gentleman's question was, uh, he hears a lot of different opinions about the dollar, you know, buy, you know, buy dollars, sell dollars, buy real estate, sell real estate, uh, and he gets a lot of opinions and he's confused. And um, I will say, I do presentations like this all over the world, five continents, I do, it, do them all the time. And as I said earlier, one of the things I get out of it are hearing people's questions. And your question is the question I hear most frequently. So the second most question is, what do you do with your own money? Well, I'm sure we'll get to that. But, uh, but that's the question I hear. People say to me, 
you know, Jim, I've been around, I've seen business cycles, I understand bull markets and bear markets, easy money, tight money, um, expansion and contraction, boom and I get all that, but I don't get this. This seems different, I'm confused. And I do hear that a lot. And my answer is, you're right. That makes me we should be, no, you should be confused. And the reason is that what we're going through is not anything that anybody has seen. You, we have, um, uh, we have inflation or the potential for inflation that hasn't been seen since the 1970s. And maybe a lot of folks lived, lived through that. We have a potential for deflation that we haven't seen since the 1930s. You have to be, you're a younger guy, you, you gotta be 90 years old. You have to be 90 years old to have a kind of a living adult memory of what deflation is like. Now, you can study it, you can read about it, that's what I do. Um, and people, I think, don't, don't read enough economic history. Uh, so, all right, def so if I told you we were definitely gonna have inflation, you would know exactly what to do. You'd lever up and buy some real estate. If I told you we were gonna have deflation, you would know exactly what to do. You, you would buy bonds and you'd have cash and you would get rid of all your leverage. So we know exactly what to do in both states of the world. But what if I told you that we're on the knife edge, that we're in an unstable dynamic system and it could tip into inflation or deflation very quickly, that both forces were in play. And this is uh, just to understand this. And you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald said the, uh, the sign of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. He said that in 1936. So the last part is the hard part, still retain the ability to function. So investors today, portfolio managers, people planning for the retirement or whatever, you've got to take two completely opposite ideas and process them at the same time. One is deflation, the other one is inflation. And this is exactly like plate tectonics. You know, I was out in uh, California not long ago, and I went out in the desert uh, east of uh, LA, and I, I stood on the San Andreas Fault. The thing is, when you go in the desert, you can see the San Andreas Fault because there's a crack in the earth and the water percolates up, and there's a green strip in the middle of the desert. There's some palm trees and grass, you can see it. So I'm a wise guy, so I went out and I put one foot on either side of the San Andreas Fault, and absolutely nothing happened, nothing happened. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's all good. In other words, yeah, nothing was happening the day I was there, but we all know what's going on underneath the surface. These two massive tectonic plates are pushing against each other. Tensions are building up, and it's going to snap, and it's going to snap bad. And that's how you can understand the dynamic. So when you see prices kind of zero to one percent month after month, you know, the economists have a pet name for that. They call it well-behaved. Uh, don't take any comfort from that. That's just like me standing on the San Andreas Fault. It doesn't mean it's all good. These forces are operating underneath. So what do I do? Or uh, what, just to kind of answer the question. I, uh, and by the way, you could have both. You could tip very badly into deflation and the policy response would be so overwhelming that we would go to inflation very quickly. And that's happened before. Look at, uh, look at 1919, 1920. 1919, there was a borderline hyperinflation coming out of World War I, which very quickly turned into a depression and went into deflation, and then it normalized, and we had the Roaring Twenties. The Twenties were a pretty good period in economic growth, but that sequence, kind of 1919, 1920, is a case study in going from high inflation to extreme deflation in a matter of two years. So that can happen. So what I recommend is uh, what I call barbell strategy, prepare for both. So, you know, my model portfolio, I'd have some inflation insurance, so that's gold, uh, precious metals, um, uh, fine art. Uh, I like fine art. People go, you know, uh, I mean, I, I do a lot, of, some of my work for the government involves uh, counterterrorism finance and, and money laundering and catching bad guys and all that. So I just happen to know that a million dollars in hundred dollar bills weighs 22 pounds, exactly. It's the, the reason is every, every you have 10,000 hundred dollar bills and uh, every bill is, uh, uh, one gram. So it comes out to actually uh, exactly one kilogram or, or, or 10 kilograms or 22 pounds. Uh, but a million dollars in gold uh, is, is more like 30 pounds. You know, so it actually weighs more than cash. I'd rather have the gold, but, uh, that, but you know, gold sets off metal detectors and stuff. But a uh, Picasso weighs $500,000 an ounce. Nobody thinks of paintings by the ounce, but if you gotta move in a hurry, you know, I, and you don't wanna set off metal detectors, 
I'd rather have the Picasso because it's it's going to retain value and it's worth more and it's lighter. But um, it's sorry for the digression. But uh, but to kind of get into your point. Yes, it has it has some gold and some fine art, and that's my inflation insurance over here. I like 10-year treasury notes. They'll do very well. Everyone's like, oh, interest rates are at an all-time low. No, they're not. Nominal rates are at an all-time low. Real rates are still very high because inflation is so low. The real rate is just the difference between the nominal rate and inflation. So if you say 3% inflation and uh, a 2% nominal rate, that the real rate is negative 1. But if you say uh, zero inflation and a nominal rate of the same 2%, the real rate is positive 2. I remember when interest rates were 13%, but inflation was 15%, this is 1980. The real rate was negative 2%, negative 200 basis points. The bank paid you to borrow money because you got to pay them back in monopoly money. Uh, there aren't too many projects that don't make sense with negative real rates. And this is what the Fed is trying to engineer, by the way. The Fed is trying to engineer a world where nominal rates are about two and inflation is about three. The real rate is negative one. And we all want to go out and borrow money and lever up and get the credit and lending and spending machine going again and all rock and roll. That's what they're trying to engineer. The problem is it's not working. I call this Mick Jagger economics. You, know, you can't always get what you want. They want 3% inflation, but they can't get there. They can get, they can get to 2% nominal rates with financial repression. They can make the banks buy the bonds. So they, they can do that. They can control the money supply. But they can't control how you and I feel, at least not very easily. So unless we want to go spend money, um, we're not going to get the velocity we need to get the inflation going. So, um, but, but they might. And the thing is, it's one of these behavioral phenomena. It's like, kind of like everyone running out of the room. You can go a long period of time with no inflation, and then it can come very quickly. See, my concern is that the Fed's going to dial it up and dial it up and dial it up and try to get to three. And when they get to three, they're going to say, okay, that's enough. Let's dial it down. But it's going to go to nine. Because it's very, very difficult to change behavior. But once you do, it's very difficult to change it back again because there's a lost confidence. So, so you need your, uh, so it has some deflation protection. That would be 10-year notes. If 10-year notes go from 2% to 1%, that's going to be one of the greatest bond market rallies in history. I have cash and people go, wait a second, Jim, you wrote, you're the guy who wrote a book called The Death of Money. Why would you have cash? And the answer is I might not want it forever, but I like it now for three reasons. Number one, it is deflation insurance. The real value of cash goes up in deflation. Number two, it, in a portfolio, it's the opposite of leverage. We all know that when you lever up a portfolio, it magnifies the return. It also magnifies the loss. So uh, a 2% gain levered 10 to 1 is going to be a 20% return on equity. But a 2% loss is going to be a 20% loss of equity. So that's what leverage does. People understand that. Cash is the opposite. It actually reduces the volatility of the rest of your portfolio. So if you've got volatile stuff like gold and treasury notes, having some cash will reduce the volatility. And the third thing, this is very underestimated, because uh, I, I manage a mutual fund and we have a big slug of cash and the SEC beats us up. They go, hey, you guys, you know, people aren't paying you to manage cash. You're not a money market fund. They go, well, they are paying us not to lose their money. And um, cash has huge embedded optionality, meaning that if, when you get better information, you're the guy who can pivot. See, if you go all in on land or a limited partnership or oil and gas, whatever, I'm not saying those are bad things, they're very hard to get out of. But if you have cash, you're the guy who can pivot, turn on a dime. And if you think about, people say, well, cash doesn't have any yield. That's true. It's very low. If you think about the difference of the yield on cash relative to some alternative investment, Think of that as the premium you pay to own an out-the-money call option on every asset class in the world. That's a valuable option. So I call this the barbell. I got my inflation stuff over here, gold, fine art, and land. I got my deflation stuff over here, bonds, and, and, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, well, bonds would be the main one. And then in the middle, connecting the two sides of the barbell, I got the cash which also gives me some deflation uh, uh, protection, but, but uh, reduces the volatility and gives me an enormous optionality. By the way, the guy who's doing this is Warren Buffett. I mean, one, two of Warren Buffett's big acquisitions recently, he bought the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. What's a railroad? It's nothing but hard assets, right? It's, it's right away, mining rights suggested to the right away rail, rolling stock, yards, switches, signals, equipment. It's just all hard assets. How does a railroad make money? It moves hard assets, coal, wheat, corn, steel, cattle, et cetera. 
So a railroad is the ultimate hard asset play. The next thing, he, he bought Suncor, which is a big energy company in Canada. And by the way, he doesn't need the Keystone Pipeline because he can move his own oil on his own railroad. You line up 100 tanker cars, it's a pipeline on wheels. He's got a pipeline, it's just on wheels. So he's got energy and transportation, hard assets. So that's his inflation protection. Buffett will never say a kind word for gold. Don't expect him to buy gold, but he's got that. He also has $55 billion in cash. That's the most cash that Berkshire Hathaway has ever had. So I always say when it comes to billionaires, uh, don't, don't listen to what they say, watch what they do. Uh, but Buffett's got a variation of this barbell strategy. So the answer is you need a little bit better. Let me tell you, I like land, this, like raw land with low carry and development potential. I like that a lot because that works in inflation and deflation. It works in both states of the world. How can that be? Well, if you have land, and assuming a good location, um, if inflation takes off, the price of land is going to go up. I mean, that's kind of intuitive. Everyone <coughs> understands that. We'll say, yeah, but if you have deflation, the nominal price of land goes down, which is true. But the development costs go down faster and with all the inputs to development. So, you know, steel, wood, lumber, labor, architects fees, they actually go down faster than the value of the land. So what you do is you buy the land, you take a little bit of a loss when the nominal value goes down, but then you develop it down here and catch the weight back up. An example of this is uh, uh, the Empire State Building. It was built in the depths of the Great Depression. The Empire State Building was built in 1931 for next to nothing. And it's been a great investment ever since, and it's a hot property today. So I hope that you're confused. Everybody's confused, but that doesn't mean we have to throw up our hands. And I think understanding that we're on the knife edge of two very different outcomes would say that I ought to prepare for both of those outcomes.